Hello. Welcome back. So, I don't have much time tonight, so I just wanted to get a little bit more in. And that's the great thing about Foundry. I just have to fire it up and start rolling dice, right? And the great thing about audio is I don't have to type very much. And earlier in the day, I can re-listen to my games. It's actually, even if I wasn't putting these on YouTube, I'd probably still do it. That's how great it is. Anyways, Bethany Thomas is outside of a newspaper. Drove there in her little broken down car that she, you know, maybe she owns it. Maybe it's a Packmates. You know, she's just kept it after they disappeared. Um, we'll just call the paper the Northland Post. And it just covers this area of town. Being an ex-fed or a fed in training, she probably knows how to do a little snake staking out, watching the place. So she's gonna do it. And you can't just say, hey, storyteller, what do I see? Instead, you have to roll the dice. So she has perception, three. I think investigation is more appropriate here than say like alertness. Cause she's literally gonna drive around the block see what buildings are next to it, see what it looks like. And I imagine this is like a, a small strip center type of newspaper. It's just like probably five people on staff, that type of thing. So we'll roll some dice. I have a three perception and a three investigation. So that gives me a six and I'm just defaulting six difficulty every time, unless it's obvious like it was storming out. She is watching for um, any sign of not normal activity in this building. Three successes, no ones. They're all above eight. No, only ones, only two are above eight. So that actually will take my scale up to eight. You know, and I may burn it. I mean, I get what I want already. But maybe I want to get more of what I want. And so burning the scale is where you you spend three points. So you reduce the scale towards zero by three. So if you burn it while it's under trouble, say so you have eight, negative eight, and you burn it, it would go down to negative five. But something a little bit worse would happen to you. And if you were in a plus eight into grace and you burn it, it'd go down to plus five. But something a little bit more, a little bit good would happen to you. Um, and this is a character choice until it gets to 10 and when 10 happens it has to happen and then it's a major thing not a minor thing if I burn it now I roll this chart and I may find a little bit extra so I succeeded on the roll so I'm automatically going to get what I want what the character wants and the character wants to find vampires so I'm already gonna give her this clue but it's going to be only the bare minimum of what she needs. So yes, there is going to be some unusual nighttime activity that would lead her to believe that these are not just normal publishers. And then, um, but missing, maybe not necessarily vampires, but if I burn the scale and I roll a great thing on it, it could give me advantage on the next roll. It could let me shift the narrative completely how I want it to be. I think I'm going to do it. I think I'm going to burn the scale. So it'll go back down to five because it always takes three off. I roll my 1d10. Oh, I guess I have it. I just, I did install this app here or this extension here. So I can just go and roll that. I get a four advantage. Something happens to put you at an advantage. You climb the wall and fire down on them. You throw the rock and they look the other way. Okay, so I get my next, something's gonna happen for my next roll that will give me um, a negative two difficulty on it. And so she wants to prove that this is a vampire run company and I made the success. So there's something there, you know, I, I kind of get this idea that maybe she's almost seeing one of them in the act of being a vampire somehow. Like um, maybe they're feeding. The vampires feed, that's how they are, right? So maybe she, um, 
watches them come down the alley with a victim. Maybe it's a drunk person. And they are very preoccupied. And she wants to follow them into the building through the back alley and get into the door before it locks. And because they're so preoccupied, like, wrestling this person, I'm going to get the negative two to my difficulty to sneak in with them. Um, I don't have oracle charts for what the people look like. So if you really want the game to be random, you could introduce oracle charts like that. Those are something in a lot of the games I play I do use. But for these ones I'm streaming, I don't want to bog you down with watching me roll a bunch of charts. So I'm just going to say one's a man, one's a woman, and they have a larger guy in between them. They're wearing um, business casual, business casual outfits. They're just they're like trying to blend into the suburbs without standing out. So like they actually do work at a paper type of outfits. You know, except they're a little ruffled. Maybe there's a little, um, little tussle, tussle like they had trouble with this guy. So I don't know if he's a victim or something else. Maybe he's she's getting about to step into something really crazy, right? So she's gonna follow him in, them in, see if she can do it. I get a negative two to my difficulty. I think that would be stealth, which is one. She's terrible at stealth. Um, but it's probably dexterity, so that's five. And because she has this specialty of precise, if I roll tens, they will um, count as two successes. Thank you, V20. I also could probably use celerity. It does, it adds automatically in this edition. Okay, cool. So that is a five and a one, so I get six, and my difficulty is going to be either four or I could roll on this chart here if I if they are vampires then in young neonate vampires then the difficulty is six but if they have a character concept that um, would make them be able to notice being traced or trailed then they would get a plus two on that so and additionally there's two of them, so they get a plus one. I'm going to just give them seven, and then drop that to two by five. I could roll... I could roll these personalities. But it's going to be very wide. I think one is going to be, probably be a publisher. Of the magazine. Let's just see what it says. Maybe it'll be terrible, and um, I won't use it. But Ten and a nine a 9 and a 10 is down here in this nebulous nebulous zone here um, where you're supposed to write things in as you think of them yourself I already wrote publisher in so I'm going to roll again Six eight, six eight, and I can't see a die a politician Okay, so yeah, I don't think they are going to be on the up and up of trying to see her <laughs> see her come in. So we're going to give her a difficulty of five, and she's going to have six dice to do it. Oh, is my dice thing allergic to ones? I think it might be. She got three successes, but only one of them is above eight, so her scale only goes up one. So she sneaks in. That's for sure. And because this is the rule that I need to change in the tournament rules, I'm going to go double check and make sure that is how I want it to play out. Because there's this um, part in multiple opponents where you get hit like double whammy, right? So in a resisted action in Vampire, you roll, your target number is determined by either a set number for both of you or by the um, dice combination of the people you're working against and you have to beat more successes than they get. And in Vampire that's fine because it's all random. You're rolling dice and they're rolling dice. But to speed up this game 
they take half. So if they have a five, then they would have um, a two or a three, either rounding up, rounding down successes, and I would have had to beat that. Now in this case, I already beat it. I got three successes, and if I'm being nice to myself, they got two. So I still beat them. Um, but it really depends on, as written, you raise the difficulty by one for each additional opponent you're facing, and then you also, on a resistant action, have to beat their successes, and their successes are automatically half. Hmm, I kind of still like that. I still kind of like how hard that makes it. I think I'll just keep it. I'll keep it how it was. So I only succeeded by one success, but that was an odd all I needed. It just makes combat super deadly when this happens, and hopefully one day she'll be in a combat and I'll be able to show it to you. So, Beth sneaks in. I picture this like the door, they don't have time to turn around and shut the door behind them, so she kind of just like puts her finger there, waits for the hear them go down the hall or whatever's in the room, and then slowly creeps back in and then shuts the door shut behind her. A modern newspaper doesn't have like a printing press right there on site, especially a strip mall one. Um, the back room is probably old newspapers and stock and you know shipping and receiving that type of stuff but they probably send out their press to somebody else and then it comes back to them for printing so i don't i don't imagine that's it i bet you it's that there's like a a newsroom front room and then there's like some offices in the back and a restroom and then the stock room i think it's a really small area and since the this is a storefront with the glass up front i bet you they're gonna move this guy into the office and she is going to spy on them and see what she hears to see what's going on. Now, again, in a normal game, the storyteller would just tell you what you hear, right? You snuck in behind, what do you hear? But I don't know. What she wants to hear is evidence that these are vampires <laughs> so that she can reveal herself and start to, and you know, admit what she is and then try to network into this city but so if she succeeds at this role that's what she's going to hear because that's how you differentiate storyteller from your own if she fails then she's not going to hear that that's pretty pretty simple so again she's going to do perception and she's listening so i'm gonna do investigation again Ooh. Man, this dice program does not know a one to save its life. So three successes, two of them are above eight, so those add to my scale. That actually moves the scale to eight again. I'm gonna to try to push it to 10, just so we can see what happens. She hears what she wants to hear. Okay, let's go back to the tourniquet rules. And let's go down to this chart that says um, clans. I don't want these to be a sabbat. So on a roll of, and because this is set for B20 as written, not for this pro, this future timeline, which is the 5e universe, um, I'm going to flip this script here. So five to one to six or one to five is going to be anarchs, and the Camarilla is going to be this. You all know the drill. And I'm only gonna roll one die because I'm just trying to establish this for what I overhear. So they are um, Camarilla, not Camarilla, they're Anarch because I'm flipping those numbers, which is what she wants. And I could have just had her find Anarchs because she succeeded at the roll. Um, I'm gonna roll another Publishers. And, but this really kind of needs a, um, nature and demeanor, random nature and demeanor. I just didn't want to publish like random charts for making a character under the storyteller's vault because I, I already feel kind of guilty for using the art they gave me. So um, maybe that'd be the next thing for this, just an, an expansion with more oracles. So I have a publisher and a politician. I think I might roll clan. I don't mind knowing something that the protagonist of my story doesn't know, so. OK, 
Okay, if Tremere Anarchs? Are there Tremere Anarchs? Maybe. That would be interesting, right? V5 has shattered the Tremere, and I kind of like how it nuked um, the Chantry. And because I'm making all this up on my own, not really going into their meta plot, I think it'd be really cool to have an Anarch Tremere in a Caitiff holding down this big guy and questioning him for information, almost like almost like it's a war footing and she just stumbled into it. Hmm. I think the, the female is chanting something. She's doing some type of mystical thing, which doesn't that doesn't freak out um, Bethany. Beth is from the Sabbat, like she's used to rites and rituals. The fact that she hasn't heard any recently is, you know, disconcerting to her more than anything else. So this vampire is chanting, and the other one is like, you're gonna tell us everything you know, you know? Um, and But the word that slips out of the man's voice as he's yelling is, Where's your vent true master, you piece of shit? And that immediately makes Beth realize that she is in the exact right place. Now the only thing I have to decide is, <laughs> does she interrupt? Or does she, she wait? Or does she keep listening? I think she keeps listening. I don't know what happens next. So what happens often when you're playing solo is you're just like, I don't know what, I don't know what happens. I got to this point, but now I don't know how to proceed. How do I add that mystery? And stories are character focused, you know, like you don't have to worry about things being disconnected from your character, especially if you're playing solo. So I'm just going to go ahead and roll this um, on my Oracle. Okay, it's not related to anything that she knows that's related directly to her. So we'll roll it on this. It's a background, okay? She has um, two backgrounds. She has status, which is um, her Sabbat status, <laughs> and she has generation. So it's not necessarily related to her background. Um, or is it? Status, 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 generation, status, generation. How would that work, right? She's going to overhear these vampires getting ready to diabolize this other guy? Or threatening with it? I think she's going to just listen. She's going to wait. These people are threatening this other vampire, um with Diablary. Generation is my key here. I rolled a seven and generation. Um, and that spurs a new Oracle thought, right? Maybe there is something really bad happening in this city. Maybe the vacuum of power has almost collapsed the Camarilla and there is a lot of bloodletting and blood hunting and Diablary going on. And it's just like a, almost like a, it might be like near post-apocalyptic vampire society still in the shadows in this city why not right and then the second inquisition's coming in and like pew, pew, pew. yeah it could be all out war so they're threatening to reclaim the blood and this Tremere um, vampire is going to force the truth out of them through this ritual before they do it and the male um person that's not being held, the one that's holding that person is explaining to this person exactly what's happening in this very threatening but matter-of-fact way. And Bethany gets all this information just by listening. And eventually the guy breaks and admits that um, he was there in their domain spying on them. And he was spying on them for another guy. And we're just going to roll a random name. 
Let's just roll it. Come on. All right, Antonio. Antonio, Mr. Say. So we know that the guy's probably a Ventru. His name is Antonio Say. Got it. Um, in that he wasn't there to do anything wrong. He's just keeping an eye out, making sure that nothing, nothing, there's no violations out here, or at least a minimum. And the the people, um, the people holding him down, laugh, and um, then start to interrogate him under this ritual that this Tremere is doing to make him tell the truth about Mister Say and where his domain is. And so there's a lot of information there that um, Bethany listens to about uh, Mr. Say's domain is nowhere near this domain and that he is a Ventru and that um, they're trying to hold the Camarilla together in the face of everything that's happening which seems to make the two happy and then there's some sickening grossness going on in the room. Bethany is going to just go into the newsroom where she can kind of watch them eat this other vampire. Sit on a desk and just kind of look nonchalant and imposing when they're done. And she'll sit there as long as it takes. And they come out of the office and they see her. And she's going to be like, hands up. I just want to talk. I'm new in town. And just trying to find my way. Let's see what that would be. It'd probably be appearance, since it's a first impression. She is dressed in you know, her business casual, her reinforced um, long jacket. She definitely has her pistol, but she wears it in a way that's not... Um, too intimidating uh, or too easy to spot um, so I'm just going to do appearance and etiquette, etiquette right which is horrible for her well it's not horrible it's just four you know four successes what the hell one of them moves the scale up one They look back at the room like, oh, snap. And they look at her and she's like, it doesn't matter to me what you eat. And they kind of smile and they're like, what's your name? What are you doing here? How'd you find us? And I think Bethany is um, honest to a fault at times. I mean, she has no, she doesn't like lying. She thinks it's pointless and a waste of time. Um, she may withhold information sometimes, but she's not going to like make up falsehoods. So, and that's what she does here. She's like, I've, I live, I was from a small town out west and, um, we got hit by something or they just disappeared. I don't know. And I've been looking for them, my, my coterie and tracked them through this town but it's a big town and so I need to find more information and figure out what's going on here. And um, your code in your newspaper made it pretty easy to track you down. So here I am. Who are you? Because she has four successes on that, that role, that first impression role, I'm not going to, um, I'm not gonna make them have a horrible approach to her. Gabby Hatchet, and the male would be Washington Dorschner. Whoever made these uh, name list are is very interesting. Gabby is wearing some occult paraphernalia that she hasn't ducked away, like a amulet, and um, they both have not visit the restroom yet to clean off the blood from their faces. So it's kind of a interesting scene in this like darkened 
newsroom with some street lights filtering in. And I think they're all kind of timid and not knowing what to say to each other. But eventually Washington says, I'm Washington, this is Gabby. And if you come and find information, you might be in the right place. We're, um, we run this newspaper to gather people like you, to bring them in and try to make some stability in this town. There's been like a power vacuum and a lot of bad people coming through. Bethany looks at them as like bad people, worse than you. And she kind of nods toward the room in the back where they had just committed diablery on a vampire. And um, she kind of smiles like nonchalantly in that whole like, haha, that's a joke type of way. And um, they kind of nod and say, that's a long story. And she says, well, and Bethany says, well, from what I heard of it, sounds like we may have a mutual enemy. I'm no friend of any Ventru. And they smile. And Gabby says, you know, I think we might just get along. And that's where we're going to end for the night. A little rough, a little short, but that's what these are supposed to be. Little vignettes into Bethany. And um, we're about to explode here with some grace. If this dice roller doesn't start rolling some ones, man. I need some ones, people. Well, I don't need them. I mean, Gabby's not going to be, or not Gabby, Bethany's not going to be angry if she never fails. But it's all good. All right, well, that's it. I'll see you next time.